My name is Claudia Eckert. I'm a professor of design at the Open University, and Philippa is my postdoc. So uh, as <clears throat> Chris has said, we're going to talk about the findings of the Rethinking Fashion Design Entrepreneurship Project. Philippa and I looked specifically at networks. So I'll first give you a bit of an introduction to the project. Then I talk about sustainable fashion businesses in general. And then I'll talk specifically about networks. And then in the end, we are very open to questions and discussions. So please let us know and keep Keep your questions or put them in the chat and then Philippa will monitor the chat and we can discuss things afterwards. So <clears throat> I think as Chris has said, this was an AHRC funded project shared between the London College of Fashion, Middlesex University and the Open University. London College of Fashion was mainly looking at the creativity and sustainability end of things. Middlesex University was looking at entrepreneurships and business ethics, and we were looking at networks. So I think the motivation for this project is that there are a lot of small fashion businesses in the UK. They are micro businesses or small businesses. So some are really tiny, maybe one person or even a person working part time. Others are maybe five, six people. There are a few businesses that are maybe 50 to 100 people. But these businesses are important economically because there are a lot of them. But they also, as this quote from Sandy, the principal investigator says, have got a much wider importance because they really are the creative engine for a lot of the fashion industry. That this is where new ideas are being developed that then get adopted, to put it mildly, by some of the high street change. And they are the people who really push the cutting edge of the technology of design, who talk to the customers and are sort of really at the forefront of things. So it's very important that this is some a sector of the industry that is fostered. And it's very important to support these businesses because, of course, producing a product that gets sold very, very cheaply on the high street in the UK in an ethical way is inherently challenging. So we feel that these businesses need to get fostered. So we looked at a lot of different businesses in this project. We started off with a survey and got about two or three hundred responses. And then from those, we picked a number of businesses that we studied in more detail. And then in a sort of snowballing way, we included some more, but we had <clears throat> mainly men's and women's wear businesses, some lingerie, some children's wear, some people did accessory. Interestingly, also quite a lot of service-based businesses who were working for other designers, and some of them were consultants. So this is their own definition, and a lot of the people were, of course, in multiple categories. And I'll talk about this later, that some of the designers, for example, would also be consultancies for some of their colleagues or people who would develop products for others might also have their own design label and design their own garments. So this is a real mix in this sort of ecosystem of different companies. And most of them, as I said earlier, were very small. They had less than nine employees. We had four that were between 10 and 50, and we had only one that was medium sized. So the fashion SMEs really are small compared to SMEs in other sectors where you would classify something as an SME if it has less than 250 employees in general. But by the standard of British fashions, 250 would be absolutely massive. So they are small and a lot of the challenges arise from the businesses being being quite small. So here's a slide about their turnover. So again, most of them have a turnover or nearly most of them of less than £100,000 every year. And <clears throat> a lot of them haven't started up fairly recently and a lot of fashion businesses start and then they disappear again so many don't make it and they are a relatively small number that really makes a career out of running a fashion label for decades 
And that's, I think, also something that we want to keep in mind to make sure that these businesses are sustainable. So before we get into more detail, we should probably talk a little bit about what we mean by sustainability. And sustainability is, of course, a concept that everybody is discussing, but that's quite hard to define. For a long time, people associated environmental sustain issues with sustainability and people in textiles get very rightly very, very concerned about the impact of textiles on the environment, whether that's depletion of water or poison and chemicals or um, <clears throat> or any other kind of resources, textiles being made from fossil fuels. There are a lot of environmental concerns associated with textiles, but that's not all. The other issue that is coming up in the discussion of sustainability more and more is a combination of environmental, ethical and economical sustainability. And that a business or any operation is only truly sustainable if it is sustainable, both environmentally sustainable, ethical, but also economically sustainable. And the ethical sustainability in fashion is maybe <clears throat> focusing largely on working conditions in textile factories in the developing world. Chris was already talking about the Rana Plaza disaster were which I think really brought it to the public attention just how precarious the work conditions are for many of the textile workers. Another dimension of ethical work is the is animal husbandry and how well sheep are being kept. So that's a merino sheep on the picture, which of course also need to be kept in good conditions. And if you look by comparison to the food industry, it would be very, very concerned about animal welfare, even though it might ultimately be the same animal. But if it gets eaten, people seem to clearly care more about how the animal gets treated than if the wool is being used. Economical sustainability is another really big issue in fashion. And I think, as I was alluding to, a lot of the small fashion businesses find it difficult to stay in business and to sustain themselves for maybe as long as they would like to sustain themselves. So longevity of businesses is a really important issue. And my picture here are knitting machines from the Transmetly factory in Derbyshire, which some of you might know. And that has been around since the 1800s. And these are old machines from the 1960s that they are still using to design, to knit their very classical garments. And it's that kind of sustainability that in some ways we are also aiming for. But there is a third dimension to the sustainability which we are very concerned with in this project. And that's cultural sustainability. And I think we're all aware that textiles has played an enormously important part in the cultural life of the United Kingdom throughout the decades and centuries, and that they are big centers of textiles. And Leicester is one of them. But these also in some ways play such an important role in the cultural identity that we're also trying to maintain those. And there are quite a lot of fashion businesses that very deliberately connect to traditional fabrics. So the picture here is of Harry's Street, which we all know about. For example, in, in Yorkshire, there is a big cluster around sort of very traditional work and and sort of traditional sportswear that would again pick up on these very age old textile traditions that exist in the United Kingdom. And sustainable fashion businesses really need to balance these different dimensions. And if you talk to people running sustainable businesses, they often care very deeply about each of those dimensions and are, are trying to get the balance right and of course the obvious contradiction is between environmental sustainability and 
and economical sustainability because balancing what makes financial sense and what makes sense in terms of environment and ethical decision is a difficult path to navigate for designers. And in the project, we found that there are many different ways of doing this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different ways for clothes to be sustainable. So let's first look at what it actually means for clothes to be sustainable. There's a number of ways in which clothes typically gets discussed as being more sustainable and not all of them are relevant for sustainable fashion businesses. But one of the things is recycled. Of course, clothes that is used again doesn't incur any of the environmental or financial cost of making it again. So one of the important thing is to increase the longevity of garments. Then from an environmental perspective, organic materials are very important. That's particularly important with cotton because cotton fertilizers are absolutely vicious poisons and nothing grows around them. And they pretty much render land, the fields themselves, but also the surrounding fields useless for agriculture. So people can't grow food next to their cotton fields and in consequence starve, which is really very really bad. So again, avoiding chemical pollution is important. A big trend in sustainable fashion is vintage fashion so that people again buy, buy old clothes, wear it again. And that's very much minimizing the consumption of new clothes. We <clears throat> having big discussion about whether clothes ought to be vegan, which is a morally interesting issue because people are very concerned about harming animals. On the other hand, leather is a byproduct of the food production that we have anyway, which then goes to waste. So this shows that many of these issues are very complex ethical issues that people really need to trade off various priorities that they might have. But what also falls under sustainable clothing is artisan production. So a lot of issues around fostering local production, generating environment, but also, of course, minimizing transport. And locally made clothing is something that has become quite important as part of the sustainability discussions. And which is partly in response to a lot of high street clothes being madly transported around the world. For example, we once studied a, a garment that was Australian merino sheep. And the sheep lived in Australia. The garment was designed in Australia. The wool was produced to Italy to be spun, brought to China to be knitted, back to Australia to be shipped out. And it was a made in Australia label that then packed it off across the world. But basically, this thing had gone around the world already before it was then shipped from Australia to somewhere in Europe. So there is a lot of hidden transport especially of bulk raw materials that people are not aware of. And so locally produced as much as possible is something that's pushed very strongly in the sustainable clothing agenda. Another issue is custom made clothing or at least clothes that is adapted to particular <clears throat> measurements of people, partly because Clothes that fits is clothes that people wear for a long time and they enjoy wearing it. And we all have got a lot of corpses in our wardrobe, sort of clothes we bought that don't quite fit and that we are bound to fit once we are over the current Christmas bulge or Corona bulge or whatever it happens to be. And there it sits and it never gets used. And the, these unworn garments are an enormous source of waste because they are things that don't easily get into the recycle stream again because they're kept until they're out of fashion. But this is part of the waste we can cut down by having more custom-made clothing or clothing that is adaptable. And the jeans at the bottom of the picture was one of our um, case study companies who 
basically makes jeans in the UK. They import organic fabric from Turkey, produce it in the UK, and their customers can decide the trouser leg length. So they will actually fit in lengths. They also repair the jeans. So these jeans have a fair chance of living as long as you want them to live. And the last thing is, I think, fair trade certificate clothing is very important. A lot of the time, designer business, especially the small ones, are really trying to look at fair pay without being able to get it certified. But certainly the spirit is an important element. But I think, as I was alluding to earlier, it's not a simple moral question whether you just want to have slow fashion versus fast fashion, because slow fashion itself also has got a big impact on the world around us. And in particular, it's a trade off between making things in the United Kingdom and the effects that this has on people in the developing world that slow fashion really values local resources, distributed economy, wants to be very transparent. But what does it that mean for the people who are producing clothes in the developing world, for people like workers in Bangladesh producing clothes for the European market is their way out of prosperity. And I had a PhD student who looked at supply chains who came from Bangladesh. And it became very clear how these Bangladeshi companies desperately try to hang on to the orders that they get from Western companies, even though we would think of this as exploitative and really ought to get stopped. But for them, this was a lifeline. This was their job and was their way of working there for a few years, getting their kids to school and getting themselves out of poverty. So, again, these are complex moral issues. And, of course, slow fashion also advocates that we buy fewer garments that are kept for longer, which in turn will probably lead to job losses in retail and have a huge effect on retail retail businesses and we're currently seeing how this is hitting the UK economy in the moment. The sum of this could be compensated if we really worked on better sort of repairs and services and if that was available more widely in the UK. But in the moment, we haven't got the skills because the UK is really suffering from a textile related skill shortage. So, again, this is something that people need to, to think about and develop. And I think in Leicester, there's now an initiative to set up training for textile production again to really bring these skills back. And maybe one of the things that's also important is we need to have a cultural shift for slow fashion that gets people to really much more appreciate the reuse of garments. And that's an important issue in how we as people talk to each other. For example, we have a habit of complimenting people on the lovely new clothes that they have. But what we probably ought to do is say, I love it when you wear this jumper. This is just your color. When we see it for the tenth time time rather than just commenting on something that's new. So there are very many subtle things that will need to happen, but that will require big rethinking in society. So there are many different ways in which sustainable best businesses can set themselves up and many businesses do many of these things at once. So I'm just going to go through some of those measures and we've got any number of combinations of that. And you will see how this comes out of these properties of sustainable fashion. So one of them, as I was alluding to already, is production, that this is a lot of it is a shift towards local production. And in the small and micro businesses, we have a lot of businesses that are either producing themselves or are hiring seamstresses or work with a small set of relatively local, carefully vetted suppliers. And it can be really challenging for a small business to find a supplier that they're comfortable with because for them it's difficult to really validate a supplier. They can't necessarily check the pay slips. They can't follow down the supply chain because it's a huge amount of work.
So finding good suppliers is a big issue <clears throat> for all the small fashion businesses. We talk to some of them have managed to establish good relationships with suppliers. For example, we worked with somebody who works almost entirely with Portugal because the Portuguese government is much, much better at regulating and in particular enforcing regulations on production in the textile industry. And a lot of the time they just buckle down and make it themselves. But that, of course, puts an upper limit to the growth of the businesses and what they can do and what turnover they can have. And while many of them are happy with this, it makes it difficult to become economically sustainable if you're really limited by your own capacity or you have to take on a second person. And then you have got a 50% increase in your work costs and that's an enormous step to take because going from from 71 employees to 72 employees is not a big deal but going from no employee to one employee or from two to three is an enormous step and it's an enormous responsibility for another person and that responsibility is something that seems to weigh quite heavily on the designers that we've spoken to. Another issue is working on materials, and there I think this is much easier for small businesses because a lot of them want to use organic fabrics, but also a lot of people use recycled fabrics or they use offcuts. So many have specialized on really getting offcuts or leftover fabric from the big mills that they then repurpose. And with small runs and a greater flexibility in design, they can really make use of them. The other logical possibility is to try to go towards low waste um, cutting patterns and it is possible to make clothes that have virtually no off cuts. But that is basically a design decision whether that's something that they want. Customization, as I said earlier, is something that a lot of fashion businesses are embracing, and that's everything from tailoring men, really custom made things to your measurements, to your taste, to things that are slight adaptations like the length of the trousers. And again, many of the businesses are very flexible that they would have standard sizes, but if they make something in small batches or as one offs, they might well respond to somebody saying, yes, but I have an odd shape or I'm a bit tall or my arms are a bit shorter. Can you make it just for me? And they would adapt it. And that adaptation and flexibility is really what's valued by a lot of the customers of small sustainable businesses. A big trend is also upcycling. And here's the example of somebody who took an existing jeans or uh, denim jacket and then <clears throat> added a picture to it. And this is, again, something that people talk about a lot, but is difficult to work on as a business because getting the supply of garments that are good enough to upcycle can be challenging. So people are making a living out of it, but it's not a very, very scalable way of making a living. So there's a number of things that designers can do to be more sustainable, regardless on what business model they're picking. They can improve the quality and durability of garments because garments that last are things that people will wear for longer, but also things that are then possible to recycle. Because if garments wear out, they basically have to go in in the moment largely into landfill, whereas if they are still in a good condition, they could be resold or um, passed on to people. And recycling clothes in the moment is not very easy because because anything that is mixed fiber is difficult to recycle and sort of things like like zips or buttons or something would need to be taken out before you could put things into any recycling machines. And that's again is a costly process. And for a long time, this has been shipped to the developing world for people to do this, but they are now very unwilling to get our um, recycled or reused garments and passing garments from Europe on for recycling in the developing world has also been an absolute disaster for them because it has essentially flooded the market with 
with existing textiles and killed off any attempts of having indigenous textile industries. So especially in African countries, it's now increasingly seen as dealing with the European textile waste is really bad for their economies and they're trying to avoid it, which means that we need to figure out what we do with all our to be recycled textiles, which is not terribly easy. Product, monitoring production can be a big challenge or keeping production in one place is something that a lot of designers would do, but can be very difficult because the more complex the supply chain becomes, the more difficult it is to monitor and the more difficult it is to maintain ethical standards. So one way of dealing with this is to have long-standing relationships with a particular set of small suppliers. Many designers are thinking about how they can pay above the minimum wage so that they at least can pay people a living wage or beyond. And that can be difficult if they're competing with much, much cheaper high street garments. What they, however, can do, and we have seen really nice examples of best practice there, is making sure that the working conditions for their own employees are good. So we found a lot of the fashion businesses are really thinking hard how they can be good employers, whether they can give people the amount of work that they want. They can give people the flexibility to work. We talked to one designer who had furloughed her staff over over one of the lockdowns and realized that working four days a week is really nice because it gives you time to deal with all of your private life crap and then you can concentrate on your professional life. So she is now thinking of maintaining a four day week and still paying the people the same salary and she is optimistic that she'll get the same work done by them but of course it's a big gamble for a small business but I think it's very it's a very morally principled one designers again can work on minimizing use of energy water and other kind of scarce resources and trying to reduce the pollution coming from production and for designers practically this is often in the choice of the materials that they are using that some materials require a great deal more processing than others and they have a choice to a certain extent in what they're using where they're getting it from and they can think about using raw materials that have less burden on the environment. Again, these are difficult moral decisions because, for example, people like to use organic cotton because of the enormous impact, as I was saying, of, of the chemicals used in cottons. But the yield is lower in organic cotton. Therefore, it requires more water and it's... <clears throat> And in consequence, people are now shifting towards using recycled materials that are essentially polyester kind of materials, which then the customers might not necessarily perceive as an environmentally friendly material. So there is, again, a lot of challenging moral questions in that. So businesses have taken a number of different approaches in terms of sort of business models of how they set themselves up. Some businesses are really deliberately setting themselves up as sort of fashion businesses for social change, that they either deliberately want to be social enterprises or they engage deliberately with local or marginal communities so that they would go out of their way to give work to people who otherwise wouldn't have worked. There are few businesses that are based on those premise and that market that premise quite heavily. Others might be doing this in a slightly quieter way. A big strategy is for businesses to really work on consumer engagement and educating their consumers and trying to make sure that the garments that they design and produce and sell meet the needs and the interests of their customers. And there are a number of ways of engaging with customers. So these days, a lot of this is online engagement, of course, through Corona, but also before that customers would be invited to provide feedback, to, to chat, to comment. And that that is something that can become a quite powerful steer for designers. 
But designers also deliberately sometimes set up ways of meeting their customers. For example, we had several designers who run workshops with customers. And that means that people would come in and she could chat to them. And that means that you get an idea of what they value, what's important to them. We studied one designer who every year traveled to Europe with suitcases full of clothes and essentially brought them to her European customers. And she got to know them quite well. So she talked to them about what they would like, and then she would come and bring them the clothes that they would be interested in. And that has worked very successfully for her in the past. And of course, currently is a challenge in the combination of Brexit and COVID. She can't travel and, she, and shipping is challenging, but she's hoping to come back to that. Also, companies are beginning to offer repair services. As I was saying, the jeans company repairs garments. We have various fashion companies that are guaranteeing that they will repair the things that they have produced. So there's a lot of things that are moving now in this relationship between the consumer and the designer and really getting a much better service for the consumer and getting value out of that service. So they, some businesses are really putting emphasis on the business models that they are adopting. So they're really thinking in terms of the work-life balance for themselves and for the employees. So, so I was saying earlier with the four-day week that kind of very deliberately making a business in a way that they enjoy working on it, that doesn't necessarily need to grow, doesn't want to get pushed into a growth mindset, but really work for them as as a conscientious employer. And some businesses are deliberately going for some sort of profit shares and give a certain percentage of their profits to charities. And completely different take we had in some of the businesses, the project studies is that they went down a digital road so that they saw digital technology as an enabler for sustainability. So we had a few businesses that deliberately sort of set ups for swapping and wardrobe management so that the garments would be worn, would be recycled in an efficient way. Some people developed various kinds of software for managing design processes more or production processes more efficiently efficiently and others were facilitating really the collaboration between different designers and production so <clears throat> you have various designers submitting or various people submitting design ideas almost getting a vote on which ones will be popular and then producing the ones that would already sell so there are many different ways where people are really thinking how they could widen up the designing in a way that then people will come in and buy things almost immediately again to avoid all of the issue of warehousing, sales over production and all of that. So <clears throat> the ends that Philippa and I looked at was primarily the networks amongst designers because designers can really not do any of that themselves. And it turns out that designers are really embedded in quite complicated networks. And I'm going to go through the different categories individually. I just wanted to show you that overall picture because when we think of networks, we often sort of think of the relatively formal networks and <clears throat> the Leicester Depot is one of an example of a formal network that the designers are part of but they are also part of many informal networks amongst other designers their friends and families are very important networks for them but also their clients and there is a huge world of social media out there that functions as a network for the designers in giving them support in encouraging them and in the directing what they are doing. So I'm just going to talk about the individual bits of the network separately. One of the really 
of course, important aspects that I've talked already are the formal business arrangements that a designer has, that nobody can do this on their own. So they've always got some suppliers or intermediaries who work with them. And this can be on any place in the supply chain. That can be just the raw material you could buy in the wool, spin it, knit it, sell it on, or you could buy the wool already spun as yarn, you could knit it and sell it, or you could have a knitwear supplier who knits for you and you sell it. So it's in any number of these stages. And many designers have got in the end quite a lot of different suppliers, even though they don't have very big ranges, because you need somebody who makes your t-shirt, somebody who makes your wovens, somebody who makes your knitwear. You therefore need the networks of the suppliers themselves and often suppliers pass orders onto other suppliers if they can't do them themselves. But fashion businesses often also use intermediaries between them and the suppliers. So we studied a couple of people who are essentially product developers who take ideas either from fashion designers or more often from people who don't have a fashion background but want to set up a clothes line and develop the designs for them, develop the product specification, find the suppliers and organize that entire process. And that seems to be quite a successful and rewarding way of being a small fashion business is to take these intermediary roles. Then, of course, as I was saying, that designers have got employees, either full-time employees or part-time employees that work for them and that they can draw on. And sometimes they also engage in collaborations either with each other or with other types of businesses that then become part of their formal networks. Some of them have got financial backers, and of course, they also need a lot of business services to draw on. And that can be a real challenge for a small fashion business that they have to deal with their accounts, with their marketing. They have to develop their websites. And it's very tempting to spend almost all of your time on running your business rather than making or designing your clothes or talking to your customers. And so they have a big support network in those terms. But for small businesses, not all of this is contractually and formally arranged. There seems to be an awful lot of swapping with services between small businesses. So, for example, fashion designers befriend the web developer. The web developer does the websites for them and gets paid in jumpers or something like that. So that very informal bartering economy seems to play quite an important role for the small fashion businesses. And then the other formal category of networks are these fashion support organizations that the designers can interact with. And there's a number of them that designers <coughs> can sign up to, which tend to Many of them are sort of national online organizations that would help designers to get in touch with each other, to possibly find clients, to find suppliers, to change ex exchange experiences. And in the past, this has been challenging for the designers who were not in London, because a lot of this is London based. But now, of course, with COVID and everything being on the Internet, this has sort of balanced out a bit more. And in, especially in London, there are also specific fashion support networks or creative support networks that are local but really know a lot about fashion. And that is making a huge difference is to really be part of a network that gets it about what a small fashion business needs. And we've seen quite a marked difference between the fashion designers who were part of general sort of creative clusters like we have here at the LCB and the ones who were part of clusters really dedicated to, to fashion and textiles. Then another source of support are sort of regional support centers like Midlands Chamber of Commerce like that. And a lot of the money in the past has come 
by European Union regional development that is all aimed at growth, which is fantastic, but it is a big problem for the small sustainable fashion businesses who don't want to grow, who want to grow slowly and organically and not become bigger and bigger as quickly as possible because they felt that a lot of the business supply so advice they were getting was really not going in the direction they wanted it to go. They wanted to gently grow in an organic way when they were confident that this would work. And they were getting at business advice that was pushing them towards taking on staff, increasing their volumes, working with local factories. And <clears throat> that was really against their principle and this chart quite badly for a lot of the designers. And then, of course, we've got national networks as well. So as I was saying earlier, the customers and the clients have become a really important part of designers' networks because it's where they're getting feedback from customers and really understanding what they want to do. So as I said, this can be online or it can be through stores that some designers have got their own stores. And also they have sometimes got pop-up stores, which is a very nice way of meeting people because you get very quick feedback on what designs will sell because if you have a shop open for a week and one design is gone after a day and the other one still is lingering around on the Friday you really see what works for people and what doesn't work for people and again this is something where the London designers have a big advantage because they have the simply a much bigger customer base and in Leicester this seems to be much more challenging and then designers work as consultants sometimes for other small design businesses but also for big companies and being a consultant for a big company can be really quite lucrative and this seems to be a way of subsidizing some of the small fashion businesses and they also have a big outreach through social media through websites through blogs and this can be challenging because some designers have got really big networks of people whom they interact with through their blogs but don't necessarily make a big lot of sales from this because if you're predominantly a blogger and you get lots of log get into your blog it's great but what they ultimately need to do to make money is to sell their garments and we had one case study where she definitely didn't get that balance right that she had tens of thousands of people reading her blog and really had relatively little sales so again this is something they need to learn but it's an important part of their networks and as I was saying earlier workshops can be a good way of engaging with the customers directly because it gives you an opportunity to chat to them and to get a sense of what they really want. But social media is playing an increasingly important <clears throat> role for a lot of the designers because they can reach out to their customers, but also the customers are beginning to expect that social media is there and that information is there. In particular, businesses who produce sustainable clothing appeal to customers who are interested in sustainability and the customers want to check themselves what the businesses are saying themselves and want to check out the businesses supply chains the businesses values and for that it's very important to have that engagement with customers through websites and blogs some designers are selling through apps, so the Instagram seems to have become a really important way also for sustainable clothing, in particular, if people are trying to reach to younger customers, it's important to to kind of also be present on on platforms like Instagram. What also makes a huge difference for designers is, of course, to get press coverage and to get press endorsements or getting any other kinds of awards, because, again, they can put this on their website. And if the customers are coming to the websites and interact with the designers through the websites, then they do really want to see, ah, she won an award or she is in, for entrepreneurship or for design. And to get this kind of feedback makes a huge difference for a lot of designers. But as I was saying earlier, it's also the informal networks that play an enormous role for um, 
for designers here. Some of you might recognize this. This is an LCB workspace where we have many, we had about six or seven designers being co-located and we studied the lady <clears throat> who was in the middle of the picture who was making garments and working as a pattern cutter, but she also worked with the hat maker who was next door to her or the knitwear designer at the other end or the lady who sells 1940 vintage garments opposite her. And these co-located designers <clears throat> are often where they spark their ideas of where they work together and where business opportunities can also arise for them. And designers also want mentors, whether this is their immediate peers or whether this is more experienced designers or people who've set up businesses. And mentorship is very, very important. And we had some designers who got fantastic advice from their mentors when they set up businesses and others who simply got rubbish advice from mentors and in consequence who are really struggling. So they are an important element. And potentially something that's not always working as successfully as it could. And designers have a lot of professional friends that they are gathering over the years. So that could be past colleagues or employees. It could be college friends or it could be people they've worked with in the past. But this is a very important part of the network, partly for collaboration, but also really for encouragement because a fashion designer has a very personal relationship to their designs. So if a small fashion business puts out a collection and it doesn't sell, it's really personal. It's their failure. It's their designs that have failed. And then they need the other designers to really come and pick them up and encourage them and nurture them along. And that plays an important role for the well-being of any business. If you sort of incorporate or include it in a whole group of designers who understand your problem, and to give you encouragement. A lot of people can keep going when others would give up. But there is also just an awful lot of serendipity to the working of people sharing workspaces or being parts of networks. That they chat, they see opportunities to work together. And that is really, really important when designers work totally on their own or are geographically isolated. That kind of occasional chat that leads to something big might not happen. If all interactions are formal, you don't have this bit of just bouncing of some ideas coming up with something marvelous. So essentially good workspaces and neighborhoods and clusters of designers are really, really important. And we got a lot of feedback that designers now having to struggle with all the Brexit stuff, that it's so nice if you can exchange your experiences with other businesses who've already filled in the forms or have figured out which career is a bit more efficient than others. And it's that sort of sharing on all levels that is really, really important. <clears throat> and of course, it's also friends and family and often spouses that are really, really important for exchanging ideas, for encouragement, often financial support in lean periods. Child care seems to be really important for a lot of designers. It's And the other huge issue is business support, because many of the design businesses are set up by people who study design rather than having an entrepreneurial background and then all of a sudden running a business and having to deal with all of the business things can be challenging and we found that several of them had family members who had business experience and then would sort of nurse them through some of the business things. And as I said, small businesses need a lot of practical support and they need a lot of encouragement to see them through sort of challenging periods. So I think that's all the networks that we have studied. So if you've got any questions, let us know. I'm going to close the presentation and stop sharing and then we can go through the questions that might be on the chat already. I can't see the chat when I'm presenting, but Philippa can summarize some of this. So please give us your questions. Well, uh, thank you very much, Claudia. Um, we've just I've just been having a little discussion here with Janet about all sorts of things about sort of the fashion industry and um, we've had a little, little talk about materials development, didn't we? Um, and I think, um, 
and about her business of up, upcycling furniture. So Janet, do you, do you have any more specific questions? Um, no, not a specific. Well, I mean, I've just been listening to the whole thing and I found it very interesting. I mean, uh, <clears throat> because what I do is related to the fashion industry because it's still textiles. Um, <clears throat> so, and I, and I also think that um, what is mentioned here to do with te textiles and this can be regarded can be applied to other ways that we do manufacturing anyway. Do you see what I mean? It, it can be applied across many ways. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Um, um, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking about this sustainability issue for a while. Um, you know, um, and um, I suppose when I first started doing my upholstery, it was in 2017. Um, and I started doing my upholstery. And it's very noticeable when you're doing upholstery, they're using all these lovely natural materials, or they were, <laughs> you know, like coconut fibres and all this kind of thing. And it really sparked an interest in me. Um, in the whole thing about textiles, not just, you know, the make, but the whole thing from start to finish and how I'm talking and seeing it on the telly so often talking about sustainability. For me, it's intrinsic. It's, it's part um, of the bigger picture. I don't think you can avoid looking at the actual fibres is my point. That's what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with being sustainable without that. But I think we need to, from my point of view, I'm saying I think it's worth start looking at other fibres. Um, because cotton uses such a lot of water. That's what I've heard. I don't know how much water it uses. Uh, and I saw an instance of um, somebody growing cotton. Um, I can't remember where it was, but they're growing it in a polytunnel or some kind of, you know, greenhousey thingy. And instead of using loads of pesticides, they basically enclosed it so that you couldn't get the insects in so evil, easily into the little cotton bowls that they grow. Um, so they'd done it like that and they'd, I think, from what I can gather, it's one of these ones where they've got the what's it called? Um, permaculture is it? I can't remember what the, it's yeah, called. Permaculture, yeah, permaculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could have been could have been that one I was thinking of, where mm -hmm. it's usually using mainly water uh, mm -hmm. things. Um, was it permaculture? But anyway, the point is that's what they were doing, and by growing cotton that way, um, is reducing the amount of insects that were able to get to the plants. Um, I'm not saying that's the complete answer, but I'm just thinking that. We're very reliant on cotton, and cotton is a wonderful material. And I like—I love wearing it, obviously. And most of us like wearing it for underwear because of its breathability. But I'm just thinking that we need to, in my opinion, this is my opinion, we need to broaden it out and start thinking about what what other fibres are there out there that we could be using in our textiles. Because to me, that would make that would finish the circle of being sustainable. Does that help? Yes. Thank you, Janet. Yes. Yes. I think can I respond on the on the fibers? I think people are working very hard on essentially viscose equivalents that are using any kind of cellulose, and that is becoming much bigger. And bamboo is also becoming quite big. <clears throat> the other issue where I think there's a lot of growth is to use more wool because we have got a lot of sheep that are produced for food, and their wool is not being used efficiently. So I think again we could maximize a lot of the byproducts from the food industry and vice versa. So I think these synergies are something that people also really need to explore. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of um, some of the people within our study used a lot of what is called dead stock. That is material that's just not being used, you know, the offcuts or the waste. It's basically fabric has just not been used um, in in, in whatever way and so so they use they use that you know because it's material that's going to waste it's perfectly good there's nothing wrong with it but it's about to be thrown away so they take that sort of dead stock and they use it um in various different ways and and one of our case studies in london she, she did that quite a lot i think she had quite a good arrangement um with that so that, that's sort of another way of being sustainable in terms of material. And a lot of the designers did focus on organic materials um, and natural fibres. Um, I have a question. Yes, certainly. Um, one thing, I mean, there's loads of really great stuff there. And thanks so much. I've been writing down all sorts of different ideas. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one thing that um, that you touched on, Claudia, was uh, uh, about that, and and maybe Martin might want to come uh, 
uh, back on this possibly. Um, uh, that about some of the kind of um, ideas around sort of slow design um, uh, and the manufacturing, uh, the, the jobs that manufacturing sort of kind of gives and the opportunities that it gives in, in developing countries. Um, you know, sort of um, fast fashion or whatever kind of gives is, makes loads of work uh, for people in, in developing countries. Uh, and a shift over to a sort of slow design thing would would take some of the jobs away. I just wondered if you know about if there's if there's any kind of um, uh, factory sort of set up in uh, in developing countries that are kind of that do both things in a sense, so that they provide work uh, for. Uh, local people, but um, but follow sort of ethical principles and use you know sustainable materials and that sort of thing. I think there are a lot of factories that are doing this, and there's a lot of excellent practice, and there are worker cooperatives and things like that that are very good and sustainable. And I think there are a lot of people in the developing world who've become quite aware of this. In particular, also textile academics in the developing world are really becoming aware of these things. Where a lot of the problem seems to be is that the factories find it difficult to manage their workload, so they take on more orders that they can manage and then they subcontract and it seems to be very difficult to trace the subcontracting and that's where a lot of the dodgy practices seem to come in because western companies have also started to really push the monitoring of of companies in the developing world and I think especially on the continent more than in Britain they are really pushing this very hard to put the responsibility on the UK retailers but they finding it very difficult to really trace the supply chains they can change essentially monitor their first tier suppliers and possibly the second tier suppliers but then it goes off and off for example if you have got t-shirts that are made in Bangladesh that are hand embroidered the embroidered is being given out to local people and then monitoring whether they are working well and who actually does the embroidery is very difficult. So you could give it to a broker who says, I'm going to give it to a collective of women. And then if the women give it to their underage daughters, it's very difficult to monitor all of that chain simply because of the sheer volume, because what people forget easily with textiles is that every individual garment is simple, but they are just so many. There are billions and billions of them. And you can't chase up all of them, which is, I think, different to your business, Jam, because you probably have a small volume and you can really check out every last thing, but you're not doing this by the tens of or hundreds of thousands. Um, it's got a follow-up question as well. Um, do you know to what extent the small businesses based here are um, accessing the the those kind of that sort of scale of of, of uh, sort of ethical production in developing countries? Because it feels like there's that, that that there's that there's I think you you described it really well, kind of going from one employee to two employees, like like it's that's such a sort of kind of big jump. But there's kind of degrees of those big jumps, and one of them is kind of like being able to sort of um, kind of have production uh, at a scale that might be able to use those 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 um, workers' cooperatives and stuff in, in developing countries. I think there are worker cooperatives in developing countries who work quite well. And I think there are also sort of craft-based businesses in different developing countries who have got very relatable issues, in particular in India. On the other hand, what one hears is the, the question is whether they produce reliably enough for Western consumption. Because, of course, the fashion industry is very, very closely tied to timelines. You need to have things in shops and you need to have them in shops together so that when people don't deliver on time, then it becomes a real issue because the whole collection doesn't work. And what we picked up from some of our businesses is that this has become been one of the reasons why so much clothes shifted away from cotton in recent years, because that often gets produced in India and the suppliers aren't as reliable as the 
retail chains would like them to be. I, I, I sort of on that point, um, <clears throat> um, you just made, Chris, um, I, I did know, I think it was a fair trade shop in Bristol that did have a sort of supply in India. You know, they they knew the factory really that well. In fact, they set up the factory themselves, you know, and they paid the work as well and they educated their ch children, etc. The sad thing is the whole business folded and it was one of the reasons why it folded was that the children they were educating grew up and says, I don't want to be a garment worker. Yeah. They'd been educated and they wanted to do something else. Yeah. So um, it's all it's all full of issues like 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 that, you know, and um, and and also from the designers it's very much how they design is very much based on the material. You really have to know the material. So sometimes they have a variety of suppliers, depending on what they're designers, they actually have quite a variety of suppliers. They may not um, wear something like jeans. You know, you tend to use or get, you know, the organic denim. It, it, that, that tends not to change very much. So you can have sort of more long term relationships with suppliers, you know, um, but it's not so easy sometimes with other materials. So it's depending on what they're doing. There's a whole host of factors there. But Robin has got had a couple of questions from the chat. <laughs> Uh, well, there were comments uh, yeah. and, and 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 questions. Um, I looked looked at the uh, jeans made by Black Blackhorselane dot com. Um, lots of different styles, uh, uh, incremental waist sizes and custom lengths. That's that's terrific. Um, but they cost around two hundred pounds or, or or more in some cases. Um, now that's. Uh, they probably would last me about five to ten years, I guess, um, especially if they can be repaired by them. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I buy most of my clothes from charity shops these days, so uh, tr hopefully avoiding some of these clothes going going to across to Africa. Um, so, uh, but I, I've got a comment here that not not all of these um, sustainable fashion businesses are as expensive as as that. Um, and I was also interested, I'm, I'm writing a book about creativity, design and innovation based on the uh, accounts of um, designers, uh, engineers, architects and, and uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm interested in any case studies from your, uh, from your research that um, have made a success of their enterprise through creativity and sustainability. And um, uh, I've got the suggestion of um, wearethought.com, which I'm looking up now, which looks very interesting. <laughs> but, <coughs> I think, Robin, that. the real challenge about this is the question where you draw the line with creativity and fashion and innovation and fashion. Mm -hmm. Because fashion is a traditional craft-based industry. So in a way, there has been very, very little innovation. And I've heard people say there have been no innovation since bias cut in the 1930s. Or alternatively, you get a lot of the innovation coming out of the potential of different machinery. But for example, in knitwear, which has you know I studied endlessly, is you now have got machines that can do what hand knitting could do always. So the question is, where do you draw, what do you define as innovation is one of the challenges here. And what we've seen is that a lot of the businesses get very drawn into running the business as opposed to generating designs. So the designing is something that has been an astonishingly small part of the activity of the designers that we've actually studied. And I was really, really struck in a way how little design had featured in that and the sort of pushing the frontiers of design and being creative in design. You've got a number of these sustainable businesses that are very successful. Like we studied Sabina that you might want to look up where some of the examples came from, which is a London-based business of a very astute entrepreneur from originally from Russia, grew up in Austria, did a degree at Central St. Martins. And you can look at those clothes and you can make up your own mind whether you say that they are creative or not. The stuff is, they are, they are well designed, think she is successful. It's, it's an exemplary sustainable business. 
it depends where you want to position your notion of creativity. I personally don't think the stuff is terribly creative. She's got some nice ideas of things that are multi-season clothes, for example, that you can make the sleeve shorter or longer or repurpose the garment. So I think that that struck me as being quite a creative idea. But again, it's something that's floating around already in the industry. So I think I mean, you can talk to Dillis about this, who has been looking specifically at the creativity angle. Mm -hmm. And and um, was that Sabina you mentioned? Sabina, yeah. 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 Um, well, actually, I mean, I'm looking at the whole spectrum of uh, creativity and innovation from things that transform the world, you know, uh, yeah. the Internet down to sort of very everyday kind of levels of creativity, someone designing a, uh, a, a birthday card for a neighbour. Um, so all those levels. So within that, um, just merely designing a new, a, a, a new garment is, is a creative act. I think that is exactly the question of creativity, because if you take something like to become technically, you're probably aware of Margaret Bowden's de definition of creativity, that creativity are things that are new, that couldn't be generated out of the rule set that already existed. And in that notion of creativity, very little fashion would fall under it. And something like a birthday card isn't a creative act, it's just a drawing. And it's so I think it, it's very much a matter of how you frame this up. Well, it's, it, it comes into the spectrum when the public is uh, urged to be creative. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, for example, the great big art exhibition that's going on at the moment. Uh, any level of, uh, you know, drawing or, or model making or anything is considered as creative. So um, because it's creative for that person. Yeah. I mean, another aspect of creativity, of course, is new pro um, new materials development, and that is a very technical and very complicated process. And and we do have one did have um, somebody within this project who embarked on making sequins more sustainable. And um, yes, because she noticed that you know sequins were very popular on clothing. You know, particularly over the Christmas period, lots of people wear like like to wear lots of sparkly dresses, and then they get discarded, and they take an awfully long time to um, disintegrate. And so that was her sort of whole business focused on that. And in, inevitably, of course, um, she managed to get a partnership with a university because she needed that 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 sort of expertise. You know, the facilities to 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 do that. And so that's another, I suppose you could argue that's another aspect of creativity, but of course a very sort of um, quite a complex and quite a sort of te technical one. Um, but that generally speaking, the designers within these case studies, for them creativity was very much about design, very much design of the garment rather than any, rather than materials. I think also creativity was part of their self-identity because they call themselves the creatives and everybody who is in these craft things by definition is a creative. Whether they're mm. creative or not, they see themselves <laughs> as the creatives. <clears throat> who was the person at Middlesex you, uh, you mentioned? Claudia? Um, yeah, um, Dillis uh, Williams is at London College of Fashion. Right. Oh, uh, right. Dillis Williams. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But you said that Middlesex were focusing on the creativity aspect. No, Middlesex was fo focusing on entrepreneurship. They are oh, sorry, the yeah. business school people oh. and the and the LCF people were looking at at the creative. We don't really know what Dillis has come up with, with as conclusions, but so essentially, we we data gathered like mad in this project, and because of the COVID situation, we ended up get, trying to follow the designers up into the COVID crisis to see how they're coping, and then we gathered even more data and didn't want to understand <laughs> things until the last moment. <laughs> yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Are there any questions from anybody else? Chris, did you have any more, or anybody else who's here? I've not got any more um, questions, but I think um, uh, it might be time to mention kind of 
how um, this what's, what's, what will result from this process and maybe how people might be able to access it. Yes, well, one of the um, outputs of this project is the um, workbook or guidebook rather. Um, and it's aimed at support organisations that support um, small fashion businesses. Um, we are, I believe the latest is it's it's at its final stage. And I think I think it's going to be launched in June. Um, and obviously for the LCB and Makers Yard, I think you'll find that an extremely useful document. Um, <clears throat> So we can keep you updated with the actual launch date. I don't think it's been finalised yet um, with, with this launch of the guidebook. And it is it, it's really to help. It's really to help businesses, you know, drawing on some of the findings for our project and, and some others, you know, is, is there to, to be a guide, you know, to, be, to help. Um, so is that going to be publicly available, do you know? Yes, I believe it will be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, well, we'll we'll share that as soon as we've got um, stuff on our various social media channels and, and whatnot, because uh, it sounds great. And and all the stuff that that you talked about today made a lot of sense to me. So it'd be really great to see kind of like how that kind of um, whittles down into kind of practical things that um, that that small uh, businesses um, can implement in their businesses that's to... right because yeah. small, small businesses um <clears throat> really do have a lot of barriers you know um and a lot of demands upon themselves because at one moment you know they're, they're a designer but they're also an entrepreneur so they have to get to grips with business you know how to run a business you know how to do marketing how to do finance if they take on somebody they have to get to grips with hr um, one of our case studies, her philosophy was quite straightforward, is, is employ the expert. <laughs> so she had an accountant, she had an HR person who did the contracts for her. You know, that was her, her way of, of, but even so, there's still an awful lot of demands, um, you know, on people. They have to get to grips, you know, who, who are their customers, things like who, who are your who are your customers? You know, get to know your customers. Um, and I remember talking to one person on this project who said, how different they were and she was talking about different parts of London and she said in this part of London customers are like this but in this part of London they're completely different <laughs> and so you there's so much to get on top of for what you know often for one person um, sometimes they do have business partners so sometimes business partners take on the more onerous tasks of, of running the business um, <clears throat> you know these small fashion businesses really you know do have have to have a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge so there's a lot of sort of a lot of barriers for them, a lot of difficulties. So, uh, and particularly, of course, being sustainable as well. Um, <clears throat> and that was one thing that was particularly striking about this um, project is that quite a lot of them focus, focus on particular um, parts of sustainability. And it was very much about what they could control. You know, you sort of feeling that oh, I can't do everything, but this is the bit I can do. You know, this is what I can concentrate. This is what I can do. For example, you know, one 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 um, fashion business used um, recycled recycled material um, as as a, you know as as one of their um, that was their key philosophies. So um, for their products, so 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 that's what I mean. It's sort of um, <clears throat> yes, it's all very it's all quite sort of um, quite quite busy and complex for <laughs> the entrepreneur, and that's why networks are so important. You know, because networks provide so much, much to them, you know, practical and moral support. I think the other thing too is that the designers aren't trained to be entrepreneurs, but then they find themselves as entrepreneurs and that there is a certain degree of misalignment between what they learn at uni and what they need to know when they run their own fashion businesses. Yeah. Yes, we found there was quite a big gap between designers <laughs> and manufacturers. Yeah. <laughs> That, you know, a lot of designers didn't really know how the manufacturers worked and a lot of manufacturers were very, um, you know, quite annoyed about sometimes I had to really hold somebody's hand and thinking, well, you should know this, you should know that. <laughs> you know, there was a quite a big gap, a communication gap between the two. Yeah. Because I think a lot of I, I think a lot of education focuses around sort of fast fashion, as in if you're being a designer, that's what you do. You go into a massive big company, you wouldn't have to worry about you know doing hr because there's a whole department 
for that. Do you see what I mean? So a lot of the education is geared up for producing designers that would work in much bigger companies. And so when people start their own, they find they have an awful lot to learn. I think it does sound like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of imagining um, um, some sort of fashion specific support organization that, that, that would allow that would do the handholding that that you know maybe the the manufacturers kind of uh, are annoyed by having to do uh, you know yes. all, the, all, all the different kind of elements of it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, and that's why um, one of our case studies. That's exactly what she did. You know, she 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 focused on that gap in the market. So she had people coming along to her with money who says, "Do you know what? I really fancy designing a nice range for horse riders. You know, niche products like that." And I've got these ideas and that her whole company focused on that. They took these ideas and she did all the practicalities, you know, helping out with all the designs, finding the suppliers, doing the tech packs for, for, for the suppliers and the <coughs> manufacturers, you know, all that whole process. That's what she did, because that was the big gap in the market, as it were. It's just managing that whole process. Yeah. 